Chuck, another explainer. Yes. Yeah, except we're running out of stuff that I'm an expert in, so we gotta we gotta reach for other places now. Okay. Yeah, um, I think I'm I'm tapped we're out. We're striking I got, out. <laughs> I got nothing left. We're boldly going where no podcast has gone before. <laughs> yeah, I, the whole universe. I got the universe covered, but Earth, that's another thing. That's so I, what there was such intriguing disastrous news about catastrophic flooding in the world recently in places that that, that are un, that we've never seen it before uh, and I just thought you know is there someone nearby and of course Columbia University has has uh, very rich traditions in thinking about uh, climate not only with the NASA a branch of NASA that's there, the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, but whole departments on this. And so we found a professor where this is what he does. Uh, Radley Horton. Radley, welcome to Star Talk. Thank you. It's great to be here again. Yeah, tell me tell me your official title. So I'm a climate scientist at the Lamont Dougherty Earth Observatory, located a little north of Columbia's main campus. I'm also part of Columbia's uh, emerging interdisciplinary climate school. Um, which is going to be on the main campus and an exciting new initiative to blend earth science with impacts and, and solutions to these challenges. And and your specialty is what within climate science? Climate prediction, extreme weather events, extreme impacts, weather. Okay. and okay. adaptation. Okay. Wow. You, so you're, you're the man. You He's got the, man. the hottest thing going right That's now. That's right, Chuck. He's the man. Extreme He's the man. Extreme weather events. Yeah. So, 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 Radley, floods are nothing new. I mean, there's the flood legend in Gilgamesh, in the Bible, and so so why should anyone think differently about recent flooding than we've ever thought about flooding in the past? Yeah, well, you're right. I mean, flooding is one of the most fundamental dangers that the, that the climate system presents us with. But as we're experiencing global warming, as temperatures are rising by one or two degrees, which doesn't sound like much, it means that that atmosphere is capable of holding more moisture. Um, and as a result, when conditions are right, we're seeing much heavier rain events than we've than When we've conditions seen. are wrong. Okay. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thanks for correcting me on that okay. wrong statement. So, I mean, and just to give a sense of this, um, over the eastern half of the United States, just in the last 50 years or so, there's evidence that that sort of worst, heaviest rain event per year now provides about 50% more rain than it did two generations ago, right? When we built a lot of our critical infrastructure. Right, so the, so, the infrastructure, that's a good point. Because when you mm -hmm. when you create cities, you say, how big should the sewer pipe be? How high should the flood wall be? How, how, how uh, what's the slope of the street towards the drain? So good engineers, civil engineers calculating all this, and they would have no idea what future um, uh, challenges with that, that they would confront with their design. Yeah, the statistics of these events have changed in a way that those designers couldn't foresee back then. And what's really, you know, distressing about it is, let's just say you increase the rain by 20%. Um, that doesn't mean 20% more flooding, it might mean 300% more flooding, right? Because it's like you don't flood at all up until a certain point, and then boom, things can get out of control uh, in a hurry. And put on top of that, a lot of this infrastructure is aging, right? It's beyond its intended lifetime, or we haven't invested enough to to maintain it. So it's a it's a challenging situation. Yeah, we we never invest enough to maintain or to take preventative measures, but we always right. have enough money to pay for the damage, which runs normally five to 10 times more <laughs> than the investment. <laughs> yeah, an ounce of prevention, right? A dollar towards, yeah, no, that's right. Okay, so holding cities aside for the moment, uh, could you tell me what is physically happening in a flood? Normally when it rains, the water just goes into the soil. If it rains a little more, why doesn't it go into the soil a little more? What, I, I, don't, I don't see the problem. Yeah, right. So maybe just to back it up even more, just to remind folks the difference between rainfall and flooding, right? Rainfall, stating the obvious here is what's, coming out of the atmosphere. Uh, could in theory be snow, but you know most of the time it's rain. Not all rain events turn into floods. So what determines whether it's a flood? Certainly- That's my question, flood. yeah. Yeah, is the, sorry, <laughs> is the rate of the rainfall. Um, but then we also have to turn to things like 
What is the land surface like? Have we replaced these soils, which might have been pretty good at with strip malls? Yes, yeah. <laughs> parking lots. Um, you know that's going to increase these flood rates dramatically. When we see regions that have experienced deforestation, or maybe forest fires during drier times, uh, eliminating some of this vegetation, that can set the stage when it does rain again for moisture not getting taken up by the, the soil, which gets sort of a, a firm surface to or it. Or the root systems of trees, right. Exactly, yeah, right. The, the trees aren't there to take up that moisture anymore. Um, so we get more extreme flood events, largely due to these longer lasting rain events and more intense rainfall per hour, right? That Because it's that sort of worst hour, worst rate of rain that matters the most. But there's these other components too, how we're changing the landscape and decisions we make about things like dams too, right? Also have, uh, and water management also have, have implications. We've seen footage, the most I've, the one I've seen most recently is flooding in Las Vegas, mm -hmm. where it hardly ever rains there. So I guess there's a difference between heavy rain where it has rained before and heavy rain where no one has any clue what to do about it because all the roofs were leaking into the interior because yeah. no one checks if your roof has holes if it never rains. Right. Absolutely. There was water flooding out of the lamp, the light fixtures and the ceiling going on all the, the crap tables and and the and the the bedding machines. And I just thought to myself, wow, this is something nobody predicted. Yeah. Well, oh, you, you would have predicted it. You pred <laughs> no. maybe I'd like to like to say I would have. I don't know if I would. It's, it's, it, these things are happening so much faster. Than and what happened in Pakistan? Update me on that. Okay, so the you know I was I was looking into that recently. We're over a thousand deaths now as a result of these rain events. Uh, wait, wait, is Pakistan in the in the monsoon zone or not? Pakistan is in the monsoon so zone. Monsoon is flooding, and they get that every year. So why is this different? It does. They're really at the extreme sort of western edge of the monsoon zone, and what that means is the monsoon on average arrives later. It's a sh relatively short monsoon season. And it can vary quite a bit year to year. Sometimes it doesn't make it all the way into extreme parts of Pakistan. Um, but this is a, so there's high variability generally there in the monsoon, but it's been really extreme this year. Since they started keeping records in roughly 1961, a little while after partition, this is the worst year in terms of the amount of rain. After the partition between India and Pakistan. Pakistan yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's actually about a decade later, but you know, 1961, I think was, was when the record started. Um, and, you know, we're talking about five to 10 times as much rainfall as the typical year, um, depending on, depending on where you're, where you're looking at. And this is, you know, to generalize about the country, a lot of mountainous areas, right? A lot of dependence on these river valleys where people are concentrated into to low areas and rivers. The infrastructure is there, populations are there, crops are there. So when you get that water being channeled uh, through these mountain valleys, um, the people, everything is concentrated in a way where the, the recipe is there for really extreme suffering. And we're seeing that by some estimates, I think 2 million homes roughly damaged or destroyed. Mm. Crop systems, you know, extremely affected. Um, Thirty-three million people, uh, by one estimate, uh, you know, experiencing. So here, we, here we have a case where Pakistan is not one of the big carbon footprint emitters of the world, yet they are suffering badly from the inaction of other nations that are, and that's that's tragic. It's tragic and it's not fair, right? Just as it's not fair that uh, young people who haven't been responsible for for emissions are going to be the ones who who suffer the most. Uh, inherit the mess. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, hey, here on the upside, guess what? We're going to suffer too. So. Oh, that's the upside. Thank you, Chuck. For that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, you know. So so in a flood, what what is what is the primary cause of death? Is it fast moving waters? Or is it uh, the standing water that becomes uh, uh, germ-infested? Yeah, diseased. Disease well, and waterborne illnesses. Yeah. What What is the more typical way of flood causes flood deaths? Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure the answer to that question. My first thought it's probably the, the depth of the water and how quickly the water is moving that tends to be the most important, certainly in the short term. But I think it's an open question that you're raising, which is. Are we accurately counting the long-term damages, whether it's mold in a building, right? Whether it's groundwater pollution, um, 
you know, as, as, as chemical sites or, you know, right. you have sewage starting. backing up because now there's a yeah. liquid, a liquid yeah. pathway between your sewage treatment, your, your, your sewers and your roads and, and homes. That's right. And thinking about this, I'm thinking about the Pakistan example, the damage to these crops, right? What's that going to mean in a country where there's a lot of people who are food ins insecure, mental health issues of, of flooding and, you know, losing your home and your and your livelihood. So it may, may actually really be an open question of, of which aspect of the flooding is the most detrimental. So are, are there parts of the world that are particularly at risk that you can warn the world about? Or do you just, they just kind of show up and say, so it's kind of, uh, not to sort of uh, make this a contest, but if you, after the fact, say, see, I told you so, well, did you really? Did you say Pakistan was at risk? No, you said the world is at risk, and then it shows up in Pakistan. Do, uh, do your models allow you some precision of time and place that was, weren't available previously to planners? Yeah, climate models are, are improving, I would say, you know, the climate models help us do these long term predictions, what are the statistics of heat waves and temperature going to be? That's just not helpful if I want to plan for tomorrow's no. flood. And I right. don't know it's going to flood tomorrow. Yeah, so we have weather models, too, which are, you know, what are used to forecast what's going to happen to a hurricane, for example, next week, those certainly are improving. But just to distinguish, you have climate, yeah. which is long term averages, and you have weather, which yes. is what's happening in your weather forecast, right? Yes. Yeah. And mm -hmm. those those forecasting models have improved. Uh, just a, a, a general statement you hear sometimes is that weather forecasting of today is as successful looking at about five days as weather forecasting was a generation ago when looking out three days, right? Or even so, one day. No, I remember. You didn't know if it was going to rain tomorrow. You, you'd have to, you, your, your picnic would be on hold until, you know, that morning. And uh, so, unless unless your grandfather's bursitis was acting up. <laughs> what a rheumatism. <laughs> what a rheumatism. <laughs> I'll tell you right on the now. porch. Oh. You gotta be on the porch. Yeah. On the porch. We're in yeah. for a big one, I'm letting you know. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck, yeah. one day I want to meet all your relatives, okay? <laughs> yeah. So I Radley, what about the bursitis predictive forces? <laughs> Right. You have an old man on how's, your porch in your, in your lab? <laughs> That's a question I've never gotten before. I'm stumped. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so tell me, let's get back to what I asked. Um, are you, do you have, what kind of precision do you have about certain regions that are highest at risk? Yeah. So in the sort of time scale of the weather forecasting, you know, we're getting better at this. One thing you're hearing more and more about now is these atmospheric river events, these plumes of moisture, uh, sometimes referred to as the Pineapple Express, because they often originate, generally speaking, near Hawaii, right, with all its, with all its pineapples. Um, under the right conditions, you will get a narrow ribbon um, in the atmosphere of moisture, essentially a, a, a river that can flow right into land. And then sometimes if the topography is right, topography is a huge part of flooding, start to rise up, say the Sierra Mountains in California, dumping out all their moisture rapidly. We're seeing instances now where some of these events can be predicted a week or so um, in advance, roughly. That's definitely progress. Longer term, you know, how good is, how strong is the monsoon season gonna be for Pakistan next year, a year or two from now? We're making progress, but there's still a lot of uncertainty. And I think a lot of surprises, a lot of areas have to assume that things that they didn't plan for could happen. It would just be helpful with all the naysayers yeah. if you could say, you know, in the next yes. two years, this region is going to have a catastrophic flood. And then it does. Right. Yeah. Then yeah. they'll shut up finally and listen to you guys. But yeah. one, one thing you can say with, with, without, in, without any reservation is that. Uh, we have seen an intensification of all weather events due to climate change and the climate crisis. And with that in mind, if you look at the worst thing that has happened to you historically, you can count on that happening again. And or something worse. Or something, or worse. something much worse. Yes, yeah, is that, is so that a fair that's, statement, Radley? That's what you should be, that's what you should be um, preparing for. That is a fair statement. And, and anytime we go beyond one city or one season, we have more statistical power. So if we start talking about a nation as a whole, the world as a whole, or an average over five or 10 years, here the statistics are totally compelling, right? We're clearly seeing those heavier rain events, 
more extreme heat waves, fewer cold air outbreaks, and more droughts, right? And some people do need to plan at those scales, right? Your insurers, your reinsurers, your emergency management officials, they need, they should be, need to be looking at that whole picture as they balance their their resources. And geopolitically, so, you could have uh, climate oh, yeah. refugees when they're, uh, what, some nations in the in the South Pacific, where the Absolutely. the average is was a meter above sea level or something or less, and yeah, yeah no right. We've been focusing on the, the the sort of flooding that's coming from rain events, but let's keep in mind too, as sea levels rise, as you know, coastal flooding, right? These these storms that are piling water up through their winds along the coast are going to cause that water to go much further inland than it did in the past even if the storms don't get any stronger and the winds don't get any stronger just because the bathtub's higher, right? Sea level's higher. Right, and, right. And for places like, you know, where, where we're sitting in New York, during a certain storm, it might be the blend of all three. Higher sea levels, a stronger storm, pushing more water on the coast, and heavier rain events. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, that was, uh, that was uh, the remnants. They call it the remnant of Hurricane Ida. So without the wind... We had a larger storm surge than a hurricane. The most rainfall that ever happened in the shortest period of time, which resulted in greater flooding. That was in than, Manhattan, right. That right. was in Manhattan. Right, we're, right. We're talking about New York City here. Right, right. Yeah. So it's, a, it's this idea of like the compound mo- risks, the multiple risks. Mm-hmm. A lot of city planners have said, how strong might the storm be? How high might the sea level rise be? How much rain might we get? But you got to put it all together. How are the risks of, of all these things occurring? Plus, what phase of the moon does it, does it happen? Does it hit your shores? Right. Yeah, for, that's right. Yeah. Man. Yeah. What phase and what time of day? It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Well, one thing that you said, Bradley, that uh, everybody should take into account, uh, which is insurance companies. If you want to re- realize how real this problem is, there is not one insurance company on earth that does not have climate crisis contingencies and uh, predict- predictive models in their business plan going yep. forward for the next 50 years. Yeah, they and the military are the leading major agencies yep. that are not climate deniers in this That's uh, right. in this equation. There you go. And of course, right. Radley. <laughs> it's not a climate denier. <laughs> yeah, but so Radley's getting all that sweet, sweet government money. Oh, oh that's him. why he's doing it. Yeah, that's Yeah, you right. know, they're making it rain on him, so he's got to say this is going to happen. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> of course, it's a big cons- science conspiracy. We all get together. Right. That's, what, that's right, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> Guys, we got to end our, our explainer here, but this is fascinating, Radley. Uh, this is, it's, it's not every day we just get a behind the scenes on what's going on not only in the world, but in the models that predict it. So thank you. We'd love to get you back on and, because we'll, we'll, we'll find other excuses to do this again because this is not your only bit of expertise you can share with us. It'd be so great with your, to talk with your permission, we'll keep you on the Rolodex. And youngins, look up Rolodex. Google it. You'll know what a Rolodex <laughs> is. <laughs> right. Radley, um, how do we find you on social media? Um, I'm on Twitter, uh, at Radley Horton. At Radley Horton. Okay, we'll find you there. Chuck, you're Chuck Nice comic, as always. Everywhere, thank you, yes. Telling people you're a comic because they didn't otherwise know, is that why you... Well, you know, uh, what can I say? I, I I like to reinforce what people may not <laughs> <That's> believe. <right. laughs> okay. <laughs> you repeat it enough, they'll believe it, right? Is that there what it is? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson. This has been another Star Talk Explainer. This one on Flux. As always, keep looking up. <laughs> <laughs>